morning. Good morning, everybody. So this morning session, uh, the, the, the talk will be by Martin Barlow. And Martin Barlow is, uh, is coming from the University of British Columbia in Canada. He's one of the leading specialists in the area of probability in the world. He has uh, published more than 100 articles, and in them he has uh, done very substantial contributions in several fields, very diverse. For instance, the equations on fractals and other disorder in media, the stochastic differential equations, mathematical finance of electricity pricing, filtration and large enlargements, local times, branching measure diffusions, partial differential equations, etc. Martin obtained his PhD at the University of Swansea in 1975 under the, the direction of David Williams. And uh, well, he has been awarded with uh, several very important prizes, as for instance the Royal Davidson Prize from the University of Cambridge, the CRM Fields Teams Prize, another. He's fellow from several uh, academic societies, as for instance the Canadian Royal Society, the Royal Society of London, the International, International? No. Institute of Mathematical Statistics, and, and well, he, he gave a very important course in the Probability Summer School of saint Fleur, etc. So he's one also uh, associate editor of several of the top journals in probability. And well, he will be speaking today about the random box percolation and the uniform spanning tree. So please join me in welcoming uh, Martin. Thank you. So, or I should turn this on. Um, okay, if my voice is too loud, let me know and I'll try speaking without the um, amplification. So, thank you for the invitation to this um, uh, nice conference and thank you to the audience for coming after me be a very late night um, last night. So, you'll notice that my, talk, my title has changed a little bit um, from what was originally on the program, the word percolation has come in. And that's because I realized that the original talk I was planning just wasn't quite going to work and I needed to say more things about the background. But we will be meeting uniform spanning trees um, towards the end of the talk. So I'm going to start by something which seems quite different, which is looking at um, a divergence form partial differential equation in RD. So we have here a matrix a of x, which is symmetric, bounded, measurable, and uniformly elliptic in this sense here. And we look at the heat equation associated with this um, uh, operator, or L on the matrix A. And um, the simplest case for us to think about this point is when A of x is just a constant, rho x times the identity. And in that case, this equation describes heat flow in a medium um, which is homogeneous in different directions, but has varying conductivity rho of x. And um, for this equation, in the case when the coefficients are, for example, um, C2, then the classical estimates using Fourier analysis and so forth give regularity of the solution U. But PDE people, for various reasons, are interested in regularity of U without putting any, oops, sorry, um, without putting any additional assumptions on the matrix A, other than that it's bounded and measurable. And this regularity problem um, was a big problem, but a long time ago, and it was solved by, different, by three different methods, actually, in the late 1950s by De Giorgi, Moser, and Nash. And the biography of Nash suggests that if... Na um, well, it would have been deemed worthy of a Fields Medal if just one of them had solved it, but because all three solved it, the Fields Medal Committee decided that the three Fields Medals in the area would be just too much. And Moser proved what's called parabolic Harnack inequality, which I'll abbreviate to PHI for solutions to this equation. And then there's developments in the 60s. Aronson proved that solutions of this equation satisfy Gaussian bounds. In other words, we have a distribution yeah, like the Gaussian distribution, but with constants which are not necessarily those of the Gaussian. So we have Gaussian and up and lower bounds for solutions to this equation. And if one's looking at more general spaces, as people do, like manifolds, Gaussian bounds take this term here, where the t to the minus d over 2 term 
is replaced by a term involving volumes of balls. Now, what's the parabolic Harnack inequality? So, the first time you see a parabolic Harnack inequality, it looks kind of um, obscure and a little bit clunky. Um, with familiarity, what one discovers is that it's like one of those, perhaps, sort of precision pieces of equipment um, in me metal making or whatever, some sort of lathe where there are numerous knobs that you can twiddle and set. And if you use it in the right way, all kinds of things come out. So the basic situation of the parabolic Harnack inequality is we have a space-time box, Q, um, a ball in space times a time interval, and we have two smaller um, space-time boxes, Q minus earlier in time and Q plus later in time. We look at a non-negative solution of the heat equation in this um, set, and then the supremum of U on the smaller, uh, the earlier time is bounded by a constant times the infimum of u on the later time. If u is a harmonic function, then du by dt, um, depending on, on x only, u by dt is zero, and so u will be constant in time, and then in fact one just gets um, control of u in this box, um, half in this ball, half bx a half r, the supremum is bounded by a constant times the minimum, so that's the elliptic Harnack inequality. Now, here's an example of the use of the parabolic Harnack inequality. Um, let me just say that it, it follows from Gaussian bounds, if we have them, using representations of solutions as mixtures of the fundamental solution. And the parabolic Harnack inequality gives, as one of the things it can do with it, gives hold a continuity of U. So supposing we've got a solution U, um, and it's between, bounded between zero and one on Q, Replacing u by 1 minus u if necessary, we can get that at this point here, it's bigger than a half. Then the parabolic Harnack inequality gives this, that a half is less than this, obviously. This is the PHI bit, that it's less than a constant times the infimum, which is less than 1. And so that on Q plus, u is bounded between this constant and 1, whereas on the previous box, it was bounded between this. So we have some kind of compression inequality for u, and repeating that, one gets hold of continuity. And let me also say that if you've got the parabolic Harnack inequality, it leads fairly easily to Gaussian bounds, sorry, the, um, it leads fairly easily to Gaussian bounds for the fundamental solutions. So people then looked at manifolds, and for manifolds with non-negative Ricci curvature, Li and Yao proved Gaussian bounds. And Gregorian and Solov cost then obtained a characterization of parabolic Harnack inequality or Gaussian bounds for manifolds. Actually, the Gaussian bounds bit was Fabes and Struck rather than these people. So supposing you've got a complete Riemannian manifold, then the following three conditions are equivalent. Very nice theorem. M satisfies the two conditions which I'll tell you about in a moment, VD and PI. Solutions of the heat equation satisfy a parabolic Harnack inequality, and the fundamental solution satisfies Gaussian bounds. Um, this can be, was extended to metric spaces, and that contains divergence form PDE on RD as well as diffusions on manifolds. And for the proof of theorem one, let me say that you have one condition involving what we'll see of, think of as low-level conditions, these two, and then two high-level conditions, so to speak. And the equivalence between B and C is fairly easy, and the most useful implication is that A implies the combination of B and C. So we have these two conditions, VD and PI, and now I should tell you what they are. So VD stands for volume doubling, and there exists a constant such that if you look at the size of a ball radius 2r, it's bounded by a constant times the size of the ball of radius r. So if you iterate, you get this condition here, and you see that the manifold has polynomial volume growth. So something like the hyperbolic disk would not satisfy this condition. And PI stands for Poincaré inequality. There exists a constant such that if we look at the variance, in a sense, of the, a function f on a ball, then it's bounded by a constant times r squared times the integral of the gradient of f, which we can think of the energy of f on the ball. And I'll sh we'll show you later how this 
Poincaré inequality restricts the extent to which the manifold M has bottlenecks. And we'll see how it can be proved from the geometry of the manifold. So this is all stuff which was done, um, well, um, it, basically um, some time ago. And now let's go on and think about what happens if these coefficients are not uniformly elliptic. And for simplicity, let's consider the case where we have heat flow in a homogeneous medium of conductivity rho, so it's of this form. And let's put Z to be the set of zeros of rho. Those are the regions where you have zero conductivity. Well, if Z has positive measure, then Gaussian bounds may not hold. The set Z is going to be acting as a kind of barrier, an obstacle to heat flow, and any positive results that we have will have to engage with the geometry of Z. And so now I'm going to go stop thinking about the continuum context and look at um, discrete models. And so I'm going to go to the Euclidean lattice, ZD, and I'm going to put non-negative conductances, AE, on the edges of ZD. And we're going to look at a continuous time discrete space heat equation, um, du by dt equals LAU, where LAU is this um, operator which is similar to the um, discrete Laplacian. And I'm going to be thinking about AE, which are random, and this is called the random conductance model. And the simplest case is when these AE are independent and identically distributed. And what we would like are, we'd like, we may not always get, would be parabolic Harnack inequality and Gaussian bounds for solutions to this equation, and what people call homogenization. So first, let me show you homogenization in the PDE context. We take a, um, an, an initial condition phi. We define un x0 in this way with some rescaling by a factor of n to the minus a half. We look at the solution that we get. We then speed it up um, in space and time, renormalizing it in this way. And if things work nicely, this rescale solution here is going to converge to a solution of a homogenized equation where this capital A is a constant matrix. And in the cases that I'm going to be talking about, it'll just be a constant times the identity. So that means that effectively V is going to be um, a mixture of Gaussians, or if we start at a single point, um, just the Gaussian distribution. Now, let, I'm a probabilist, so let's look at the probabilistic formulation of homogenization. So remember, we've got this operator here. And associated with this operator is a Markov process x, defined in this way, that the probability of it jumping from x to y is axy times the time length of the interval h plus oh squared. I'm going to write capital P for the probability law of the environment here, and px omega for the law of x started at a point little x in the environment given by A of omega. And what we'd like is a central limit theorem for x, so the rescaled process in this way converges to a Gaussian. And we want to allow the probability of an edge having zero conductivity, which means the process can't cross it, to be bigger than zero. So the simplest model would be when we take the AEs just to be zero or one. And that's the model called percolation, which was introduced by Broadbent and Hammersley in 1957. So we fix a probability p between 0 and 1. And for each edge, we keep it with probability p and delete it with probability 1 minus p, independently of all the other edges. So let's call curly O the set of edges which are kept. And for reasons to do with the history of the subject, these are called open edges, thinking of being as edges where fluid can flow through the channel. And the connected components of this graph are open clusters. And we're interested in the infinite clusters of this random graph. Now, fundamental theorem in this subject is there exists a critical probability between 0 and 1 such that when p is smaller than the critical value, all the clusters are finite, and this is called the subcritical regime. And if p is bigger than pc, then there exists a unique infinite cluster, which I'm going to denote c infinity. In, I'll come back to P equals PC later in the talk. It's conjectured that all clusters are, f are finite, but it's not being proved in all dimensions. 
So here's what percolation looks like um, in uh, when the case of p equals 0.2. You see lots of little clusters. That's the biggest cluster in the box that we're looking at. I've now increased p to 0.4, and that's the biggest cluster there. Now I've increased it to 0.5. This is actually the critical value for two-dimensional bond percolation. And there is the biggest cluster, which in this case just happens to cross the box in both directions. Here we are now at 0.6, I think. And pretty much the, the big cluster now fills up all the box apart from some small regions. Here we're going up to 0.8. And the big cluster now is practically, well, fills, fills up everything. So you see how as we increase P, we get from small finite clusters to a big space-spanning cluster. And so I want to look at random walk on these clusters. And in terms of the operator LA defined earlier, we're just going to take AE to be 0 or 1, that that we have here. And supposing we have an inequality like this, that NA, B minus A, is bigger than a constant times the size of A divided by R, whenever we have a subset of A satisfying this condition, then you get the Poincaré inequality. If you've got a ball of radius R in um, ZD, then, and we take A to be half the ball, then NA B minus A would be R to the D minus 1. So we've got R to the D minus 1 here, a half R to the D here, divided by R. So we see that the isoparametric inequality um, will hold. Of course, you have to do a bit more work to prove it in general in ZD. But it, it's a, it's a geometrical problem, and one can um, solve that question problem. So if you've got an isoparametric inequality, then you get the Poincaré inequality. And so if we're thinking about random walk on percolation clusters, what we should do is we should apply um, Delmott's theorem. Um, and the entry point is going to be to prove volume doubling or Poincaré inequality in this context. But they don't hold. And the reason is that we're looking at a random graph. And if we look far enough away, anything um, can happen. So if we look far enough away, we would, for example, be able to find um, an area like this. And if the random walk starts at the bottom of the z here, then basically it's going to think it's in a one-dimensional region for quite a long time, rather than a two-dimensional region. So we won't see the same kind of behavior that we would st start it at a typical point. What's working for us, though, is that we have to look a long way to see such things. And I'm summarizing it like this by saying, big, bad regions are a long way away. So supposing we're looking for a specific bad configuration with volume little r. This is going to have a pro probability of order e to the minus a constant times r. So looking for it in a big ball, we need to have this condition here. In other words, little r is going to be about um, uh, log of capital R. So the biggest bad region in a ball of radius, capital R, is going to be of size roughly order log r. So in this rather um, unclear picture, we're looking at a ball center x. And the black regions here are sort of regions where we perhaps have mis missing bonds. And this area here is a kind of area where we have one of these um, bad regions so that the heat or the process starting off at x is going to find it hard to get to y. And so one might wonder whether the um, bad regions of size order log r are going to cause log corrections in the Gaussian bounds. And the, the answer is no. And the reason for that is that the time to region of, leave a bad region is about log r squared. And this is much less than the time for the heat to homogenize over a ball of radius capital R, which is about r squared. So let's look at isoparametric inequalities for percolation. So we're going to fix non-random constants, c1, c2, c3. And I'm going to call a ball good if both the volume and the Poincaré inequality are about right for the ball. So the ball is of, radiant, of volume about r to the d, and the Poincaré inequality holds for this ball. Then various people 
um, using percolation methods, showed that in the supercritical regime, the probability that a ball is good is, um, well, the probability a ball is not good is bounded by a stretched exponential of um, this form here, so very small. And this number is small enough so that even if we look at all the balls, ball of radius y, um, center y capital radius r contained in this big ball with little r over a reasonable scale of le lengths here, all those balls are likely, still likely to be good with probability bigger than this, essentially the same form. So a, ball, a single ball is good if things work for it. A ball is very good if all the sub-balls in that ball over a range of, range of length scales are also good. So the natural guess is that if a ball is good so that volume doubling and Poincaré inequality hold for it, then the transition density of the process should satisfy Gaussian bounds when we've got points in the ball and time is of the right size. And that guess is about right, but good is not enough. You actually need to use iterative efforts and differential inequalities to prove these Gaussian bounds, as we'll see soon. And these rely on the space being regular over a range of length scales. So actually we need um, good for a lot of balls over um, a range of length scales like this. And so you need very good rather than good. So these are the Gaussian bounds that um, I um, obtained. And here we have the Gaussian distribution with some constants C1, C2, C3, and C4. And this is the transition probability of the process in the random environment given by omega. Now, these bounds do not hold for all x and y and t. They only hold when t is bigger than some configuration-dependent number tx of omega, which is a random variable on the configuration space and has a stretched exponential tail like this. And let me say that the randomness of the environment, so that in the process starting at the foot of the z, you would have the, that tx omega being big, whereas at most points it will be small. And you need some control of the random variable tx for applications. You start the process off. After a certain amount of time, it's landed somewhere. And you then, if you want to apply the Gaussian bound starting at the place where it's landed, you need to know that the tx at the place where it's landed is small. And so you need to take some supremum of tx omega over, over boxes. And the stretched exponential tails that we have here are enough to be able to do that. And the proof used the ideas of Nash rather than those of Moser. So let's now look at Nash's um, uh, idea. And the key step in his 1958 paper was to show that if we look at this quantity here, which a probabilist would say is just the expected distance if the, from, if the process starts at x, um, the expected distance of the process from its starting point at time t, then this quantity mxt grows like t to the 1 half. And the way he did it was he looked at the entropy of the transition density and found an ingenious but not transparent argument using three inequalities between m and q. So we have these inequalities here. And he showed, this is a just a real variable lemma, that if you've got functions q and m which satisfy 6 to 8, and m0 is 0, then m satisfies the um, condition 5. You can handle this, you can prove this result with the techniques of um, first year um, uh, integral, um, a first year calculus class. But um, you probably need good students to be able to actually um, uh, obtain that re um, result. If, you, if you've got really bright students who, who want to challenge, you should, you should give them this problem. And he, Nash just, in fact, used this, his method to obtain holder continuity of U, but Richard Bass showed how, in fact, you can then use it also to get Gaussian bounds. And the technique works for graphs, and it's useful for percolation, because if we fix a base point x, then the distant bad regions don't have much effect on these quantities m, x, and m and q, which are kind of rooted at the point x. So it's regions a long way away don't affect them much. 
And many other approaches um, use global inequalities, which um, will fail for percolation clusters because, for example, in Poincaré inequality globally fails because um, you just look at a distant bad region and, and there it is, um, the, the Poincaré inequality failing. So one does still have to prove the three inequalities, six to eight. This inequality follows from an upper bound on the PTXX, which was proved by Maffey and Remy, which just comes from the condition volume doubling and point Poincaré inequality for very good balls. This inequality just follows because the, we know that the volumes of balls are bounded by a constant times r to the d. And the final inequality, q prime bigger than a constant times m prime squared, actually holds in general. So proving these three inequalities um, is not so hard. Nash's technique then takes over and leads us to getting um, Gaussian bounds. Now let's go on to look at the second problem we had, which was to look at and show a central limit theorem. And this was proved by um, three teams of people. And we take a p bigger than pc. And for a set of omega with probability 1, a functional central limit theorem holds for x. Restating that, what it means is that if we look at the rescaled random walk, then started at 0, then P0 omega, looking at this under the law P0 omega, it converges weakly to a constant multiple of Brownian motion. And so in particular, the CLT that I mentioned earlier will hold. And actually, Berger and Biscop found an argument in two dimensions, which doesn't use um, the Gaussian upper bounds that I showed you earlier. But the other, for d bigger than or equal to 3, one does need these Gaussian upper bounds. And this, using the physics terminology, the CLT is quenched. In other words, it holds for a set of environments which has probability 1. Now, how does one prove such a CLT? So the basic strategy of the proof is we have this random um, graph, subgraph C infinity. We perturb it into a graph which is harmonic. So we move a point x in C infinity to a point phi of x, which of course depends on the configuration omega, and phi satisfies the following conditions so that the Laplacian type operator here applied to phi, in other words this thing here, is zero at all points in C infinity. So let's write chi of x to be the amount that we've moved to the point little x. And chi is called the corrector. Terminology goes back to at least to Kozlov. Um, working in the, in the Russian school. And so we can write x as the sum of phi of x and chi of x. Now, phi of x is a martingale with stationary ergodic increments. And the technology of CLTs for martingales is very well developed. And so the rescale process, mn, converges to a, a constant multiple of um, Brownian motion. And so this term here, everything works out nicely. The hard part of the argument is to control the corrector. And what we would like would be that if we look at over s between not time 0 and times nt, divide by root n, this quantity here converges to 0. So let's look at the function phi in a fixed box. So what I've done is I've taken a fixed box. I'm looking at percolation with probably, I think, 0.8 in it. So some, although all the points are in the cluster, some bonds are missing, like in this little region down here. If we then look at the function um, phi in it, you can sort of see how the points have been moved. Um, you can still sort of, I chose the probability quite high, so we could still see where the points had come from. Here is the, the second row of points here. Here is the third row of points like that. And what we should see is that each a point like this is at the average of the locations of its neighbors. Here we can see that too. In some cases, it doesn't look quite so obvious that it's true, but I think it still is. Sorry? Down at the bottom. Four, four. 
Uh, oh, yes. Ah, that point will just collapse in there. Yep, so we don't see um, one, one of the points we, we shouldn't see. Um, so this is what the function phi is in a fixed box. Now, if we fix the boundary of a box, it's easy to, um, you know, to, to show that that's, the, the, the equation has got a unique solution. What we want to do, though, is to define the function phi in the whole space. And the methods for that are, are somewhat more complicated, and I'm not going to go into them, but they involve techniques where we actually look, instead of looking at a random particle moving in a fixed environment, we look at the environment viewed from the point of the particle. So we imagine ourselves standing here at the origin, and the environment, random environment, moves um, uh, around. And rather surprisingly, that process is um, ergodic, because the long-range bits of the environment, is, it's always the same environment, but nevertheless, the magic of ergodic theory means that this, this process is actually ergodic. And then using various sort of L2 methods, one can show that one can construct this function phi. And let me say that the construction of the corrector the shows that the function chi has got polynomial growth and is sublinear on average. Sublinear on average meaning that if we look at the sum over a box of radius n of the probability or the fact that this is bigger than epsilon times n, then this limit here is zero. And Biscop and Prescott proved a nice result that if you have these two conditions, then you have pointwise control on the um, corrector. And this pointwise control is going to be enough to give us the um, uh, quenched functional central limit theorem. So the condition here is that we have Gaussian bounds. And here's an idea of the proof. We know that phi of mt is a martingale, and phi of x is x minus chi of x. So we apply the fact that this is martingale, this is zero, we start the process at x, and then we expand, we substitute for this, we get the expected value of xt minus x, and then the expected value of this term here. So we can rearrange this here to give us that chi of x is bounded by the distance capital xt moves in time t, and this expectation here. And the Gaussian bounds enable us to control both those terms. So this term is controlled because we have Gaussian bounds so we know how fast a process moves. This term here is controlled because the x lands at some random point, and then we use the sublinearity on average here to say that this term is also going to be small. So we get some kind of control like this, and then setting things up in the right way, the final term is small using um, the sublinear, well, using these two conditions. So this is a sketch of the proof. The actual argument is a little bit more complicated than that, but um, this gives you how the idea, at any rate, of how the corrector can be controlled in the situation we're looking at. Let me just say that in two dimensions, um, you're, you're in the situation of having an ergodic environment, and on any one line, the um, increments of chi are going to be small, and so you, the ergodic theorem gives you that the chi is small, but there are lots and lots of directions. There are not so many directions in two dimensions, so you can actually control chi in two dimensions, but in higher dimensions, there are just too many possible directions for the process to be increasing, and so you need some kind of argument like this, at least so far. So we've seen how we have got Gaussian bounds and a parabolic Harnack inequality in this context. And as I said before, well, the, the parabolic Harnack inequality follows easily, fairly easily from the Gaussian bounds. Now let's look at a rescaled transition densities like this, and let's write KTXY for the Gaussian. Then the quench central limit theorem implies that on any little ball like this, these probabilities converge to the um, uh, same thing with uh, um, integrated against the Gaussian. Now, the parabolic Harnack inequality, as we've seen, gives Holder continuity of these transition densities. And so that enables us, in fact, to replace the convergence of integrals by pointwise convergence. 
So we, we actually have the general principle that if we have the functional central limit theorem plus a parabolic Harnack inequality, then we will also get a local limit theorem of this kind. And so the traditional thing in homogenization is to look at central limit theorems, but if you add Gaussian bounds, you then get nice pointwise limits and much better control on things like this. Okay, so I've given what I've shown you so far, results about percolation, um, there are two natural directions for further work. And the first one would be to look at a more general random conductance model with AE ergodic. And so um, in the IID case, this problem was solved by um, well, a number of people worked on it and paper with Andres, myself, um, Deutschel and Hambly gave the general result pulling together a number of special cases. And in the more general case of AE just ergodic, these three people have made significant recent progress. What I'm going to do instead though now is to look at the, um, uh, the other natural problem which arises, which is what happens as we take P down to the critical value PC for percolation. And look at this or other critical models. And so let's now look at what critical percolation is like. Um, uh, so in other words, P equals PC. So here is a conjecture which has been open since the um, beginning of the subject, that when you're at PC, there are no infinite clusters. This was proved in 1980 by Keston in the, for the D equals two case. And in the 1990s, Hara and Slade, um, using the LACE expansion, showed it for D bigger than 19, recently improved by this person to D bigger than or equal to 15. So there's a gap. And actually, I mean, the, the techniques here and here are completely different. There should be some general um, argument which shows this in all dimensions. Um, uh, Antal Jurai said it was a disgrace that they hadn't solved this problem yet, but um, they haven't. So what can one do if there's no infinite cluster? Well, if you look at a big box in, um, in ZD, with high probability, there's going to be a cluster of diameter ON, which I've drawn here like this. So imagine that we're at a point close to the origin. This is the origin. We look in a box of size N. There's going to be some, some big cluster which sort of crosses that little box here. If we now look at a much bigger box, the, the little cluster, the cluster that we, the big cluster that we had before is going to be finite. It's probably not going to be that much bigger than the box that we were looking at. But somewhere else, there's going to be a much bigger cluster which spans the big box that we have. And the same pattern is going to go out all the way to infinity. So this, um, these, the existence of these clusters is um, uh, known. What's not known is uh, that whether they sort of in fact are all finite or not. So, sorry, we've gone on too far. So, Keston formulated the concept of an infinite, the incipient infinite cluster, which is an infinite connected random subset of ZD, which locally looks like the large finite clusters. And for an infinite graph, we can define something called the spectral dimension, this is the first sort of crude description of how the random walk behaves on the graph. And it's the limit of the transition probabilities in, in this way here. And in the case of ZD, you can easily see that it's, um, the spectral dimension is D. And for the supercritical percolation cluster, the spectral dimension is also D. So these physicists made the conjecture in 1983 that for the incipient infinite cluster in ZD in all dimensions, the spectral dimension should be two thirds. This conjecture is now not believed to hold in um, low dimensions. Uh, computers are a lot faster now than they were in 1983, and um, the simulations are good enough to show that it doesn't hold, I think, in two dimensions. But Cosmo and Lachmi has, has shown that this conjecture does hold for standard percolation when D is bigger than or equal to 15. So this is the high dimensional um, case, we have some results on in, the super, in the critical case. What about two dimensions? 
So here is site critical site percolation on the um, hexagonal lattice. Uh, so we have two possibilities, red or white, and we get um, this um, configurations like this. And Smirnov showed that the boundaries between the red and white regions converge to a conformally invariant continuum process called SLE6. And this is um, spectacular process, um, progress on two-dimensional um, percolation, part of the work for which Smirnov got his Fields Medal. And using this limit, many exponents have been calculated for the IIC for the two-dimensional percolation. For example, the dimension of the cluster is 91 over 48, and the dimension of the boundary of the holes is four-thirds. So many things can be calculated for the two-dimensional um, percolation clusters. But I don't know of any generally accepted conjecture on what DS should be. Normally, the physicists have got some guess being way ahead of the mathematicians, but in this case, even the physicists don't agree on what it should be. And basically, to calculate DS, it seems that we need information about the two-dimensional percolation, which the SLE theory on its own isn't going to give us. So I want to go on now and look at um, one case where we can study a critical model. And first, I'm going to introduce the FK random cluster model. So let's go back to percolation, look at it in a finite box. Let's write E for the set of edges, bonds in B. And let's look at the probability that the open edges is another set, E prime. Then basically, you, you get a P for every E in E prime, and a 1 minus P for every E not in E prime. And so you get this expression here. Now, the random cluster model introduces a parameter Q and perturbs this probability here by putting in a term Q to the K E prime, where K E prime is the number of connected components of E prime. It will rather of the, of the box B with edge set E prime. And we have to put in a normalizing constant. And what's nice about this random cluster model is that it unifies percolation, easing, and POTS models. So a whole class of important models of statistics, statistical physics into um, one family. Now, here's just recalling what the probability of um, seeing a configuration E prime is. Supposing we now look at the limit of nine as P and Q both go to zero with Q much less than P. So since Q is small, the measure, we want this term um, to be big, and so we want k e prime to be equal to 1. In other words, we want to look at edge sets such that there's only one connected component. So that is giving, forcing us to look at edge sets where the subgraph spans the whole graph. And since p is small, we want as few edges as possible. So actually, p, this probability measure here, will concentrate on configurations which span the graph but with as few edges as possible. In other words, it's going to um, concentrate on spanning trees. And that's been proved by Hagstrom. In fact, he was the person who introduced this connection. So if we look at the limit um, of the FK model, we get the uniform spanning tree. And I've shown you how it works for finite boxes, but the same result also holds in, um, uh, the, in, in the whole space ZD. So here is the actually not terribly illuminating picture of what um, part of a UST looks like in, um, uh, in two dimensions. So because we've taken a limit um, of P and Q goes to near zero, the U UST model has no parameters. But Hagstrom's result shows that it can be regarded as a, as a limit of the FK family of models. And it's critical in the sense that we have just enough edges to make connections across um, big boxes. So it, it's reasonable to regard it as a, a sort of critical um, a model which is being sort of selected to be at just that criticality. And the local description of the UST is much more complicated than percolation. In percolation, you, you've just got IID bonds. So it's a bit of a surprise that the UST actually turns out to be easier than percolation. And the reason for that is because we have, I mean, one of the things we're interested in percolation is long connections in the, in the um, space, because we're looking at connectivity properties. The UST 
we actually have a description of the long paths in the UST, whereas we don't have such a description for percolation. And now let me tell you about what that is for the UST. The paths in the UST are loop arrays random walks. So for a loop arrays random walk, you take a standard simple random walk, and each time it returns to a point it's visited before, you erase the cycle or loop that it's just created. So if you run it starting at a point here until it hits a set here, what you're going to end up with is some self-avoiding path from the point to the set. And David Wilson produced an algorithm for constructing the UST. Um, I'm just telling you how it is in two dimensions, but it works more generally. We label, we, well, we order the points in Z2. We start off with um, a tree which just consists of the point Z0. Then let's, this thing here, denote the loop erasure of a simple random walk run from Z1 until it hits the set U0. And of course, that event occurs with probability one because two, in two dimensions, simple random walk is recurrent. And more, we do the same thing more generally. And so UN plus one is UN union the loop arrays random walk from Zn plus one to Un. And you go on building things that way, and that gives you a construction of the UST in two dimensions. And this also shows you that the path um, from a point to the origin um, is, is in fact a loop arrays path. And somewhat remarkably, the, the, whatever order you take these points here in, you still end up with the same, um, uh, you, you end up with the, an object with the same probability law, in other words, with the law of the UST. So, unlike the percolation case, we can actually calculate the spectral dimension of the UST. And with Masson, um, we showed that it's in fact this number here, 16 over 13. So, where does the 16 over 13 come from? The first thing we need to know is that the loop, a simple random walk path from the origin to the boundary of a ball, of course, is of length n squared. Loop arrays path is shorter because we've erased lots of loops. And it's, in fact, of order n to the 5 fourths. This was first shown by Rick Kenyon um, in two, about 2000. So let's put theta equals um, uh, 5 over 4. Now, a fact about the geometry which you have to prove is that if you look at the um, number of paths connecting, or number of long paths connecting the origin to the boundary of this ball, then there are about all the one of them. Um, that's actually say, what I'm saying should actually say is that you look, need to look at the number of paths between the ball of radius a half n and the ball of radius n, and there are order one of those in the UST. So let's look at one of them and call it the backbone. By the way, the UST is a one-sided tree. Um, so from any point, there's a unique path out to in infinity. And basically, you, you, you build this backbone of the UST, and then everything else comes off it. Now, the simple random walk on U has to take n to the two theta steps. It's just look, looking at it on the backbone. It's just a, an ordinary simple random walk on um, a copy of the integers. So it has to take n to the two theta steps on gamma to travel from 0 to the boundary. And so it visits a typical point on the backbone n to the theta times. And it, there's nothing special about the points on the backbone in terms of visits, so it will make this number of visits to many other points in this um, ball. And so the total time to leave the ball is going to be about this time tn, which is n to the 2 times n to the theta, which is n to the 13 over 4, so that's where the 13 is coming in. And n is then tn to the 4 over 13. And at time tn, the simple random walk, again, you have to prove it, is going to be roughly uniformly distributed on this ball. So this probability is going to be about the number of points in the ball, n to the minus 2, which is tn to the minus 8 over 13. And then the spectral dimension, well, once you've got this, this result here comes out. OK, so um, my final slide is just going to show you a picture of the UST in two dimensions um, constructed by Russ um, Lyons. And to explain what the picture is here, here is the origin. The blue path that you see here is the unique path from the origin to the point on the other side of the um, uh, square. 
And the vertical heights show you the distance of these points from the origin. And so, I mean, the thing you notice here is these big cliffs, and that's because the thing that we've got is a tree. To get to the origin from this point here, you can't go directly. You have to move through the, the, the tree and so make some sort of slow descent round like this and then um, go on. Um, I mean, there's a, 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 this picture perhaps suggests a whole bunch of um, other interesting questions about the USD. And so I'm going to close here. So thank you. Yes. Do we know the how? No. Okay. And what if the lattice, suppose you have the lattice and you have a P value here and a P value here, and say the positive side of the lattice and the negative side of the lattice, you have two different values of P, both of them bigger than PC. Does this still have, does the, the, thing, the thing convert still to a Brownian motion? Okay, I would think, let's, I mean, Serene, that's a nice question. Um, okay, so. What one would say is one would expect to have the Gaussian bounds. Um, the arguments for the Gaussian bounds should carry over to that case. Um, but of course, in the Gaussian bounds, you, you, will have, you, know, you have different constants. So what I would expect it to converge to is a diffusion process where you've got one conductivity on the left-hand side and a different conductivity on the right-hand side. And some kind of um, appropriate behavior on the interface. Um, it's a nice question, and uh, existing techniques would need to be pushed maybe just a little bit further in order to, um, uh, to get that result. Um, because the current constructions of the corrector rely on the whole system being ergodic um, over the whole of space, which is, is not the case here. Now, there is a paper by Chen, Kumagai, and um, Kroenchen, Kumagadai, I think, where they um, do look at this kind of case where you, you have, um, um, what, what they're actually doing is looking at cones and things. So whether or not their results would apply to this case, I don't know. Anyway, very nice question. Other questions? Well, in that case, let's thank again Martin for this. <laughs>